Our bishop has asked that the following letter be read at all churches in the diocese this weekend. It's dated February 24th. Dear friends in Christ, as we begin our Lenten observance, I come to you once again in regard to our united effort to safeguard the first freedom guaranteed to us in our Constitution, namely our right to religious freedom. The First Amendment of our Bill of Rights states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. When the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services directed nearly all employers, including our Catholic institutions, to make available abortion-inducing drugs, sterilization, and birth control to their employees, our fundamental right to freely exercise our faith was infringed. President Obama announced some adjustments in language, but these do not change the mandate, nor do they address the valid concerns about religious liberty. This is no compromise, since there is no difference in the effect of the new ruling. Catholics and others who object to these life-threatening drugs and procedures are still forced to facilitate their availability. Catholic bishops throughout the United States continue to object strenuously to this immoral and indefensible regulation. We have been joined by many members of other faith communities and civil liberties groups in our efforts to defend our first freedom. Our faith cannot be defined or compromised by a government edict. Recently, His Eminence Cardinal Timothy o um, Dolan, president of our Bishop's Conference wrote, despite how it is being portrayed in the media, this is not about contraceptive, abortion causing drugs and sterilization, although all should recognize the injustices involved in making them part of a universal mandated health care program. It is not about Republicans or Democrats, conservatives or liberals. It is about people of faith. This is first and foremost a matter of religious liberty for all. If the government can, for example, tell Catholics that they cannot be in the insurance business today without violating their religious convictions, where does it end? This violates the constitutional limits on our, of our, on our government and the basic rights upon which our country was founded. That ends Bishop um, Cardinal Dolan's comments. Our bishop continues in his letter, I concur with Cardinal Dolan and am personally asking you to exercise your responsibility of citizenship and let your member of Congress know you support legislation that will correct this error and restore our religious liberty and right of conscience. The information you will need is available at pacatholic.org. It's also available on our diocesan website. May God bless you and sustain you in this holy season. Yours sincerely in Christ, Most Reverend Joseph P. McFadden. Our bishop wants to wake us up. Now I know that many of you have already responded to your to your representatives. But the bishops are trying to tell us how serious this is. I, I personally like the bluntness of Bishop Zubik, the Bishop of Pittsburgh. When he wrote to his people, he said, and I quote, Kathleen, Kathleen Sibelis, and through her, the Obama administration have said, to hell with you, to the Catholic faithful of the United States. To hell with your religious beliefs, to hell with your religious liberty, to hell with your freedom of conscience. We'll give you a year to figure out how to violate your consciences. And he goes on to say in his letter that as the other bishops throughout the country have said that, that we cannot, we will not follow this mandate. This past Thursday, our bishop, Bishop McFadden invited all the priests to, to spend part of the day with him. We had a couple of conferences on, on, on Lent, and we also had time to pray together. We had time to celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation with one another. 
And then the bishop spent some time filling us in on some just just a little information about different aspects of the ministry. And, and he spent some time on, on this issue. And he asked us to, to implore our, our people to, 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 again, to write, to, to put pressure on our legislators. But, but also, in a particular, he suggested that we, we focus in on, on Senator Robert Casey Jr. Um, our bishop has had a couple conversations with the Senator, Senator Casey, and, and he believes that Senator Casey... Um, needs to be pushed more on this issue to do more for the church on this issue so he asked us to to contact the senator as well the bishop shared with us that earlier in the week he met with congressman joe pitts here in lancaster along with some other religious leaders of the area and those involved in, in different ministries and at one point in this the bishop was presenting um, the church's position one of the protestant ministers stood up and said bishop on this issue, we are all Catholic. And our bishop felt, um, was very appreciative of the support from the ecumenical community on this issue. They are counting on us to speak up, to protect their own religious freedoms. And so our bishop asked us as a group to speak out with one voice. Our gospel today, It brings back images of, of the second chapter of Genesis. Where Adam is in a wasteland, in a, a wilderness. He's, he's surrounded by wild animals. He's alone. Eve hasn't been created yet. And he names all the animals. And eventually he will be tempted and he will fall. And he'll be banished from the garden. Angels will be put in place to, to keep him out of the garden. And we have that story of the first Adam contrasted with the story in today's gospel. The second Adam, Jesus Christ who is also in the wilderness, surrounded by animals. But he is being ministered to by angels. When he is tempted, he does not fail. He does not fall, but rather he is triumphant. And at the beginning of this Lenten season, you and I, we have a choice to be conformed to that first Adam or to be conformed by the second Adam to live in imitation of the one who would fall or imitation of the one who would be obedient, the one who would lead us to death or the one who will lead us to life. The choice is ours. That is the choice that is being held up for us in this Lenten journey. To place today's gospel in context, we have to recognize that, that Jesus has just been baptized. The skies are torn asunder and the Holy Spirit descends upon him and the voice from the clouds declare that he is God's beloved. My friends, you and I are God's beloved. You and I. We have been baptized into Christ, the new Adam. We are called to walk as children of God, not as children of that first Adam. And our baptism is what saves us. As St. Peter says in today's God in second reading, he tells us that the story of Noah is a prefigurement of our own baptism. Why was the world destroyed by the flood? Because of sin. Sin leads to death. But dying in Christ and rising in Christ leads to life. And if we have fallen since our baptism, then we need a second baptism. What the early church fathers called penance, reconciliation, our second baptism. Reconciliation with God is the fruit 
of the Paschal Mystery. It's at the heart of why Christ came into this world, so that we might be reconciled to the Father. He laid down his life so that we might have life with God forever. And so if we are not reconciled to God, we are not experiencing the joys, the fruits of Christ's labors, we are lost. Christ did not die so that we could continue on in bondage and in sin. He died that we might be free, that we might held, hold our heads up high, that we would not walk in shame, but that we would walk in the dignity of Christ, that we would serve him free from the entanglements of sin. That is what this Lenten season's about. It's about being set free. Our gospel is perfect for this first Sunday of Lent. Jesus' message is simple. Repent and believe the gospel. To repent means that we acknowledge that we are in need of God's mercy. Quick examination of conscience. Does my life reflect more the disobedience of Adam or the obedience of the second Adam, Christ? Simple examination of conscience. To repent is to seek out the Savior. And most specifically, to seek him out in the sacrament of reconciliation. For it is here that Christ ministers to his people. You and I, we have a right to this sacrament. Christ came into the world that we might know in our bodies the salvation in store for us. To experience in the flesh his forgiveness. And he continues that ministry of reconciliation through his body, through his church, in the sacrament. We'll be spending time on that sacrament throughout this season. But this is our right. Our, the gift and the fruit of Christ's passion. The season is complemented with, with many opportunities that we can find in our bulletin for adult education and for spiritual growth, for spiritual formation. Please take time with your bulletin. In addition to the, the traditional practices of, of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we have the beautiful devotions here of, of having Wednesday evening Mass so we can be drawn ever deeper into the Paschal mystery. We have the wonderful devotion of of every Friday during Lent having the Stations of the Cross. What a beautiful devotion of following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ to Calvary. These stations illustrate for us the love that Christ has for us. They're a beautiful way to examine our conscience, to be drawn into the spirituality of dying and rising because you and I are called to pick up our crosses and follow after him. There is no better preparation for us for Good Friday than making the Stations of the Cross a part of our Lenten devotions. I encourage you, please come on Friday evenings. So we have choices. At the beginning of this Lenten season, choice between life and death, between the first Adam and the second Adam, between the holiness that we're called to or the depravity that we see all around us, the choice to participate in the ongoing mission of Christ or to not, in integrity. Let us be drawn into the life and the mission of Christ, our Lord and our Savior.